you, thank you. Um, so, uh, as the title indicates, this talk is going to talk about cookie tossing. Um, we are more precisely going to talk about like how cookie tossing allows to leverage what is commonly thought to be quite not interesting and unexploitable attack, which is self-success. And then we also see some novel web attacks uh, that I hope you will find interesting. So, uh, in total, like there would be three attacks. Uh, however, like this talk doesn't really aim to to be a, an exhaustive list of attacks, but rather to highlight the full capabilities that cookie testing can have, and to make you interested about this attack vector, um, this gadget, so to speak, uh, regardless of whether you are in the offensive or defensive side. So, who am I? Uh, my name is Thomas Uu. Um, as I told, you can pronounce it however you want. I don't really care. Um, I'm a bug bounty hunter, so mainly for the Swisscom bug bounty program. Uh, so that will mainly explain why most of the of the case studies of this talk will be based on bugs reported to Swisscom. Uh, it might at, it might at some point look like advertisement for Swisscom, but <laughs> that's not really the case. Um, then uh, I also more recently reported vulnerabilities to X, and uh, kind of took advantage of the fact that 80% of the engineers being fired might be a good point to start security. To, to start hunting on the, on the program. And then uh, I, I hacked on other programs from HackerOne mainly. And uh, I also happened to be a student at ETH Zurich and from, uh, so from September and for, for the cybersecurity program. So let's, let's start right now. Um, what's cookie tossing? So that's, that's pr probably the most important slide of this talk, since <laughs> otherwise it would be quite, kind of difficult to understand. So I just read it. Um, cookie testing is an attack where a malicious or a compromised subdomain inject cookies in the victim's browser such that they would apply to all other websites under the same parent domain. So um, this might look a bit difficult, but it is not really. Um, it's kind of three steps. So first step is that the victim would visit the evil.copy.com, which is an evil subdomain that the attacker somehow control. We'll see like which type of control is required uh, for this attack. Then the second step is that, is that this evil subdomain would inject into the victim's browser some evil cookie for now. And um, the particularity is that this cookie are set for the domain copy.com and not for evil.copy.com. And uh, as a result of this particular behavior, what would happen is that in the third step, whenever the victim would visit any subdomain of copy.com, what would, um, so let's say target.copy.com, if that's the website that the attacker, the, the subdomain that the attacker wants to target, um, the victim will include the attacker's cookie, um, in such a request. So that is cookie tossing, basically. That is such, um, not that hard behavior. And this is something which is totally, like, authorized by browsers. There is no vulnerability so far. But, uh, it would be very useful, as we see. And it's the beginning of many, many attacks. So. Um, how common and practical is that? So uh, we talked about like evil.company.com, so the attacker somehow needs to control um, a subdomain. So is it like too hard to, to, like, to practically find vulnerability with that? Um, actually, not that much. A first note regarding that is that the attacker doesn't, doesn't need to have proper remote code, remote code execution. And actually, JavaScript execution is enough, as we'll see, and as you saw in the previous slide, since we can basically inject cookies from the document.cookie thing. So, uh, there, are, there are two main ways to get cookie testing. So the first way is maybe the most easy one, and it's actually cookie testing by design. This concerns applications which have, like, which allow the users to to have kind of isolated subdomains, but within the domain uh, of the main company. So a very good example of that are blogging platforms, website builders. So you may know Weebly, Squarespace, Shopify. Um, so that's an example. And basically, what happens when you have well, when you are a user uh, of such applications? You can basically like uh, inject your own custom JavaScript, so you have cookie testing by by default. Sorry for the microphone. <laughs> um, there's, there is also the platform as a service as a service case. Uh, so Heroku, Bubble, like whenever you are a customer from from these, you by default have custom JavaScript execution. So a cookie testing gadget. And finally, there's also this um, telecom provider edge case. Uh, so I'm mostly talking about Swisscom here, since that's the only provider I know of. And uh, what happened is that Swisscom has three domains where um, they basically allow their customers to point uh, these domains to their own servers. So f customers from Swisscom may have their own domain, uh, their own server, which are pointed to by these domains from Swisscom. So yeah, that's cookie testing by default and by design again. The easier situation. Then we have the option two, finding a, a, a vulnerability. So if the, if the application you are targeting doesn't really have 
such user object isolated subdomains, or if it has one, but like you are somehow not able to become a customer because like you are not citizen from the country the, the company is operating in, or like it may be too costly. Um, so yeah, you need to find a vulnerability in this case. So the, the three vulnerabilities you would be interested in are, are obviously remote code execution, since basically you have full control over the subdomain. Um, then you also have HTTP response splitting, which is a more exotic vulnerability where the attacker is able to to manipulate the, the response headers uh, from the victim's browser, like from the victim's request. So in this case, you would just inject um, a set cookie header and you would get cookie tossing. And yeah, finally, the most like obvious case also, which is XSS. And uh, as we saw, we can, from the document.cookie um, JavaScript code, inject any cookie uh, from any subdomain. And um, XSS max might also seem quite hard, since it's quite like finding an XSS in the main app can be difficult too. But uh, remember that you don't really have to find an XSS in the main app, but just on a subdomain. And for that, a, a really classic technique, which works very often, uh, surprisingly, is to upload SVG files. So like it concerns all applications that have a feature of photo upload. And basically, SVG is considered as an image. And uh, what happens is that the browser parse uh, SVG image and can execute JavaScript code from that. So if you are able to once um, upload any SVG files, in a web server, in a web application, you are most likely, you most likely have a, an XSS on a subdomain and you have cookie tossing. Um, and for huge targets, what you can do also, if you don't really want to take the time of finding a, like a boring XSS, you can also just use nuclei and that, that works too. So that were the two options for cookie tossing. So now the Alloscop subdomains. Um, actually, so these two options rely maybe on some on some reconnaissance. You either have to find a, a vulnerability or you, know, you like you need to know that the website has this particular customer domain which uh, allows customer to have their own server uh, which are, which is pointed to by this subdomain. But a very, a very good place to start is just to look at actually at the out of scope subdomains. So nobody really cares about them. And uh, you, could, you could also just check on X and check the bio of DJ Bobo on security. And, uh, and yeah, because the Swisscom.ch is out of scope, but um, very useful actually. So um, now we're just going to see how to turn self access into a high impact vulnerability with cookie testing. So the first main thing. Um, and actually, um, this image kind of represents well what happens with self access is that uh, beginners, whenever, so to speak, whenever they have uh, an access kind of thing, they are done and that they might report it. So they never escalate it. And yeah, so that's why. All people, uh, all program managers hate self XSS. Uh, then people might think that it's not an interesting vulnerability, so never report it, never, re never report it. And uh, eventually people might uh, try to, to leverage it and to escalate it to, an, in to an, uh, an interesting vulnerability. So just a quick intro about um, XSS. So XSS is just manipulating the JavaScript code uh, of a page log, like you, from a trusted origin, we, uh, we assume. And there are kind of three categories, or two maybe, depending on what you put behind the word uh, reflected and stored. So reflected is just um, that the payload from the attacker's HTTP request, like from the HTTP requ request, uh, reflects back into the response HTML. Uh, so in a more in a non-persistent way, since it depends on the just the prior HTTP request. Uh, then there is also the stored ex uh, XSS, where the payload is actually stored in the page, and so doesn't really rely on a particular initial request. And there's also this, the DOM XSS, um, where the payload is passed into a JavaScript sync and uh, executed from that. So not really from the immediate HTML, but rather from the constricting DOM and uh, like just getting passed through JavaScript functions, which are dangerous and which are able to execute code. So that's what it was about XSS. Um, what about self XSS now? So in this picture, self XSS, self -XSS is just um, an XSS that can only trigger within the attacker session. So you are indeed able to manipulate JavaScript code at some point, but you have no way to, prob to propagate it to a victim. So uh, that's kind of useless. Um, so example of such uh, features which might be vulnerable to self XSS are private node feature, or also post preview that only the attacker can see at some point. And so this is what makes this vulnerability considered out of scope, for instance, by Amazon and Uber. So yeah, no one really likes self XSS. Nobody cares about them. And uh, yeah, the classic, so now, yeah, um, the classic most known way to, to exploit self XSS is actually um, CSRF. So CSRF is a, is a vulnerability 
So cross-site request forgery, which allows a uh, an attacker to force a victim into doing a particular action. So if you have something that only the, the attacker can execute, you just use CSRF to force the victim into executing that thing. So that works. Um, however, that's not uh, often a good strategy because modern frameworks make it quite easy nowadays to implement CSRF tokens. So CSRF are, are not, yeah, not that present. And that also about uh, the browser cookie policy with the same site enforcement. So depending on which uh, enforcement the, the session cookie of the victim is in, uh, you might actually find an XSS, so without any CSRF token, but the victim uh, tokens will never get sent cross-site. So um, yeah, you, would, you wouldn't be able to force the victim into doing anything. So we need actually another, another strategy. And before introducing the strategy, let's talk a bit about the same origin policy. Um, it's kind of just a, a way to isolate websites of different origin by restricting the JavaScript capabilities. So it just prevents a website of origin A to read the cookies uh, of a website of origin B, to read the local storage, to make an, an XML HTTP request to, those, to, to that website, and to read the response then, and uh, to read the DOM if this page from different origin is open as a new frame. Um, on the opposite way, so this is kind of the point of this slide, and what interests us is uh, on the opposite way, if we actually have JavaScript code execution on the same origin, we all we have all of these things which are possible, and so we will see how uh, powerful it could be and how it can make us reconsider self success So given the capabilities of um, JavaScript code uh, when on same origin, we might want to, to change perspective on self-excess, and we might at some point not care anymore about like the victim being authenticated as the victim, but just the victim like just triggering the attacker's self-excess at all. Like we just want this at this point. And um, so the statement associated to that is that the excess can be seen very as an origin problem and not as a session problem. And um, the associated, the underlying thing is that um, as an attacker, as long as we have as long as, long as we are able to get um, JavaScript code execution on same origin, we suppose we assume that we are able to to like to to sort things out, to sort things out, and to like to escalate it. So from that, we only want one thing: is just to authenticate the victim as the attacker to trigger the attacker self XSS. We don't care about the victim being authenticated as the victim. And so this is where cookie testing coming comes into play. Um, so we we just get the same illustration as before. But, so the victim would just visit initially the evil.copy.com, then the attacker would send, uh, would inject into the victim's, into the victim's browser the evil cookie, and then the evil cookie is actually the session token, since we want the victim to be authenticated as the attacker. And uh, the twist is that we only set this cookie for a particular path, and uh, so we will see why very soon. And so what happens as a result of this twist is that whenever the victim would visit um, target.copy.com, not as before the victim is authenticated as the victim, since it's not about, since the path is like the broad slash path and not the path for which the cookie was set. But whenever the cookie, uh, whenever the victim is visiting target.copy.com, so, or any other subdomain with the path related to where the, the attacker inject the cookie, then the victim would be authenticated as the attacker and not as the victim. And so this particular point is very important for the attack. So given all of, the, all of that, we can finally um, dive into the methodology and the attack scenario, the, the general thing to escalate self access into the impact for vulnerability. Uh, so the first thing is that the victim would visit um, the evil of vulnerable subdomain just to so that the cookie listing can trigger. Then the attacker would redirect the victim to the self access trigger endpoint. And so in this case, um, so the, the, the victim would be authenticated as the attacker from the cookie testing attack. And uh, we come to the third step, which is actually the most interesting step, where um, the we're setting the path, uh, just like we're setting the, the, the cookie of the attacker just for a particular path makes sense, finally. Um, what happens is that, so for each node uh, denoted in green is an endpoint of the web application where the victim is indeed authenticated as the victim. And for the red endpoint, the victim is authenticated as the attacker. So what happens is that, the attacker on the self XSS has same origin capabilities from the for, the, for the arbitrary JavaScript code. And from that, so benefiting from what we've seen before, um, if there is, for instance, an API, key, an API key endpoint, the attacker can just, from the malicious XSS endpoint, make an XML HTTP request to the key, then get the, get the response back. So this is something which is allowed by the same origin policy when on same, on same origin. 
And uh, another case is that if there is a change password feature, uh, the attacker could also trigger the, uh, that functionality and just reset the password. So kind of CSRF-like, even though in this case we are on same origin. So that's SRF. And so, yeah, so that was the methodology. And given this methodology, we're going to see the first um, case study. So finding availability on Jupyter Hub. What is um, Jupyter Hub? Jupyter Hub is a multi-user platform that allows users to run Jupyter notebooks on a shared server. So um, basically, there is a single, a single domain in the most common implementations, and every user has their own path, and they can run their own notebook. So that, that, that is that simple. And the um, first interesting thing to notice is that every user are on the same origin, and it will be very interesting for later. And what's interesting about Jupyter Hub is that for uh, Jupyter notebooks, self-success is actually by design, uh, since we can just use that syntax, uh, percentage, percentage GS, and we can just get self-access. And, and actually, uh, Jupyter.org, Jupyter uh, yeah, I didn't really know about the self-access before making the slides. So if you ever find a cookie testing on Jupyter.org, you might uh, want to put this talk in practice and, and find the uh, availability there. So um, from that, we can just save the notebooks where the JavaScript code was put. And uh, so we just save it, and we get our endpoint for self-access. Then about cookie testing. So given that Jupyter Hub is a, widely, a widely like deployed project, um, cookie testing is a case by case, like is a case by case uh, basis. We, we can say it that way. And but yeah, given the scale of Jupyter Hub, it can basically be assumed. And uh, it's for instance very popular in universities, which uh, have uh, well, like we really love to to host trash or slash insecure subdomains, which are actually subdomains run by students. Um, I actually discovered. Uh, Jupyter Hub from a course at ETH, and what happens is that so that was the subdomain of the Jupyter Hub implementation, and right be right below is like uh, blogs.eth.ch, and any student can just host their own blog uh, on this site. So there's obviously a cookie testing there since any student can inject any like arbitrary JavaScript code. So that was for my case, but there could be many such cases. Then uh, we get our final ingredient, which is pivoting. So at this point, we might be able to to put the victim into the attacker's path where the self-access triggers, but we need to pivot um, so from other endpoints of the applications. And in this case, we have a very like kind of easy way, since the workspaces endpoint of Jupyter Hub just uh, just include into the JSON response the uh, the victim session token. So from that we get our full chain. And what happens is that we are doing cookie tossing. So we inject the 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 victim's cookie. We eject the attacker's uh, session token just for this path where uh, where the self where the notebook is stored. Then the victim is redirected to the self-access endpoint, and finally we are to the pivoting stage. And uh, from the self-access malicious poison notebook, we are able to make an, uh, we are able to make an XML HTTP request to the workspaces endpoint and read the response back. So still allowed by same origin. And so yeah. That was the, that was that, so that led to CV 2024. And what's interesting about this university is that self-access was basically by design and it should, like, it was probably there for a very long time, many years probably. And yeah, nobody looked about that. And the, nobody cared really about that. So that, that look, that, that proves a bit like how cookie testing and such attacks can be widely misunderstood or unknown. And yeah, so, so, so that, that was the first case study. Um, the second case study is uh, Swisscom MyCloud. So first thing, we are looking for the first ingredient, which is self-XSS. In this case, we get a stored self-XSS on the file names uh, endpoints. So this thing particularly is injectable. And so we get our first uh, gadget. Then there is a cookie testing by design in this case. So it's not self-XSS by design, it's cookie testing by design, since it fits into the, into the thing, into the case that, uh, like, any customers can have their own server where domains point to. So just we, we can find easily an XSS on the cus.swisscom.ch. And so we have now cookie testing. And uh, finally, the pivoting part. In this case, it's still easy. But so this case might look like a bit trivial since the, the session token was not protected by HTTP only. So we are just able to read the token from the, the, token from the, the cookie jar. But uh, yeah, the, the pivoting part is not really the, the hardest part. Uh, and if it was not that case, like there, there would be other ways to, to do so. 
And so, yeah, that was the one click you can take over on my cloud. So you just follow the, the usual steps, the usual chain. You do cookie testing, then the self access triggers, and eventually you do the pivoting part. Even though, like, this part is not that much pivoting, so you can, we can just stay uh, on the self access endpoint and read the cookie jar. So we get the session token. So now some novel attacks with cookie tossing. Uh, we'll discuss about multi-step process hijacking and targeted action poisoning. So yeah, this time a uh, bit coined by, by me, but you, you will see what it entails. So uh, first, um, what, is, what is a multi-step process? Uh, a multi-step process is just a sequence of HTTP requests and response um, that, that are just linked to the same feature. So an example of that is just the user sign up. There could be a first request where the victim specifies the full name, um, address, phone number, etc. Then there could be a second request where the victim or the user at this point uh, will specify the email address and password. And then a third request where the user would have to verify the phone number. So third request, but still associated to the same process. Then uh, state and substate. So within this multi-step process, we can talk about state and substate. State is basically the most naive thing and thing that you would maybe consider as a basic user. Uh, you are either registered or not registered. But actually, under the hood, what happens is that we have substates, and it's more like there are more complexity in that. So we might be in the step where the user provided the full name, address, and phone number, but not at the email and password, and didn't verify the phone number, obviously. And uh, we might also be in the, in, in the step just further, where the user provided email, password, prior info, but didn't verify the phone number. So. It's adds, it like, it, it adds way more complexity in the process. And this is why, uh, like, this is where is the, the underlying issue. So, um, unleak substate now. So regarding the, the substates, uh, in a multi-step process, the web applications needs to always know in which current state the user is in. And so for that, there are two, there are two cases. If the user is already authenticated, that's basically the easiest way, since we can just correlate the substate with the user ID thanks to the session token. Like we can just say that user X is on substate uh, A at each, like at a particular multi-step process. So that's kind of easy. But things get more difficult when the user is not authenticated, since um, HTTP is a stateless protocol. So we have no really way to to know who we are talking to consistently into the same process. And uh, a common approach to tackle that issue is to use state cookie. So state cookie would kind of act as like an intermediary session token to just recognize the victim, the user, um, through the process. And so, yeah, that's the common implementation. And um, ba basically, like everything, uh, uh, this attack uh, mass massively depends on how this um, state cookie will be handled by the web application. And so the attack, whenever the server doesn't assign a new state cookie, to the user at each new substate of the multi-step process, there is this issue. So just uh, what's the attacker protocol in this case? The attacker would go through the multi-step process until reaching a specific substate. So the attacker would get initially a state cookie. And by going through this process, the web application, like underlying, in the underlying backend, would um, just upgrade and keep track of the advancement of the user through this process. So the attacker just evolves his state cookie, his own state cookie, through this process until reaching a particular step. Then can inject this, this state cookie in the victim's browser with cookie tossing. Then let or trick the victim into doing the next critical step of the process. And finally, since the state cookie is only injected once, uh, is only updated once by the application, the, the attacker can just use back his own state cookie that he knows of and uh, jump back into the process and like hijack it. So first and main case study is the like Swiss call main account takeover or straight jump to 2FA. So we'll see how it goes. Um, this Swiss com login is, um, it's kind of long multi-step process where you first submit your username, then password. At this point, if there is 2FA on the user account, um, then you pass the challenge. If 2FA is not set up, you might be forced to set up now. If this is the case, then you set up it. And if it's this, um, if it, this is not the case, then the session token is granted and you are, you are logged in. So this is the process for, for logging in on Swisscom. And, uh, what happens is the insecure state handling behavior that I talked about. So the condition, in this case, the state cookie was only assigned at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of the process. So right after the user provided the, the username and it was never updated until granting the session token. So 
and granting the session token has the effect of consuming the state token, uh, the state cookie. So after being logged in, the state cookie wouldn't be able, uh, wouldn't be able anymore to, to lead to a session token. So the condition is fulfilled and we can, we can just, um, jump to the hijacking step. So, um, what happened is that the attacker would, in this case, just inject his state, um, his state cookie at the very beginning of the process in the victim's browser. Then the victim would submit username and password. And at this point, the user would just be able to jump back into the substates, but which are not substates where the session token is granted. So in this case, there are three branches and the attacker would be able to, to, to jump into two of the three, of the three branches, which correspond to step where the session token is not consumed. So he, he would be able to jump at the 2FA challenge. So once the victim provided a password, the attacker would be able to, to just make the 2FA challenge. So if he is, if he is able to, so that is the jump to 2FA case of the, of the title. And in the case that the victim is forced to set up 2FA, the attacker would actually be able to set up 2FA for the victim. So with his own known phone number or email address, etc. And in this case, it is the pure account takeover case. Uh, which is interesting. And otherwise, if the victim is not forced to set up t uh, 2 FA, the attacker wouldn't be able to, maybe instead, maybe in, like in the case of a race condition, but that would be more difficult. Like the attacker w w wouldn't really have an intermediate state to, to jump back, to jump back in since just after providing the password, the session token would already be granted. And so the state could keep consumed as a result. So that was the main case study about that. Then shorter case studies still related to this thing. Um, hijack of Swisscom account creation from existing mobile customer. Uh, so basically there is, um, a multi-step process from, for registering customers. Um, they can provide, uh, their, 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 their private customer number, their bill, their bill number, uh, then they provide a physical address, credentials for new account, etc. So at this point, it's kind of similar. You inject the attacker state uh, cookie at the beginning of the process. Here, the sensitive information of interest are the private customer info. So, you want the victim to provide this info. You let or trick the victim into doing that. And then you, I, like, and then you jump back into the process right after. And like, at this point, that's only information that, attacker, that, that the attacker knows of. So, uh, so that's the jacking of this part. And then for the second case, that's kind of similar. Um, instead of providing the, the customer info, in this case, it's entering the mobile phone number, uh, like, which was, which was registered in the, in the Swisscom store and, uh, verifying the phone number. So the attacker is not supposed to either to like to both know the phone number and to be able to verify it. So the attacker would inject once again the his own state cookie at the beginning at the beginning of the process. Then the victim would provide his info, um, and uh, eventually the attacker would be able to jump back into the process and just set up the credentials for the new account that he wants. And so the account is created under like the phone number of the victim, which was set up in store. So we can assume that there are some private information associated to that to that number. And, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's also like a third case studies, which is related to, um, 2FA bypass. And yeah, still very similar. It still concerns the login process. First, um, the victim, like the attacker in this case, submits the username and password since we just want to, to bypass 2FA. So we assume that the attacker already knows the, the username and password. Then we let the victim su uh, succeeding the email challenge. And whenever the, the, the email challenge is, is uh, succeeded, we can just set up the new phone number. And uh, in this case, we are logged in as the victim again. So uh, the general detection methodology for this is that we identify a multi-step process that includes any sensitive secret disclosing step. So it might be the password of the victim. It might also be the, the private customer info, or like any other things that the attacker is not able to, is, is not supposed to know of. Um, then you basically observe how the server keeps track of substates. And if the server either relies on a state cookies that is assigned once, just at the beginning, at the beginning of the process and never afterwards, then, um, it is vulnerable. It, it, it is like actually vulnerable, vulnerable to, um, this multi-step process hijacking. So now the third, like the second attack is uh, targeted action poisoning. So it basically consists of injecting attacker session cookie in the victim's browser, but only for the path related to a particular action within a web application, and so that the victim would un unknowingly perform this action on the attacker's account instead of his own. So uh, we find again this schema uh, from the self access thing, but in this case, we don't want the victim to trigger any self access, uh, but rather to just perform a particular action which will disclose credentials or any, sensi any sensitive things over the attacker's session. 
So in this case, it would be add credit card. And what happens if the victim is poisoned this way is that everything would look fine on the user interface. The victim would think that he's logged, at, he's logged in as, as the victim, since like the profile would correspond to his own profile, etc. But there would just be one poison feature, which would be the add credit card feature. And in this case, whenever the victim would add a credit card, it would be done under the attacker's account, and the attacker would be able to find the credit card of the victim on his account. And so the victim would never realize that. Oh, we just think that it's a bug that the credit card didn't get added. So which type of action uh, are we interested in in this case? So any action leading to the submission of, of, of sensitive data, adding credit card or file upload or sh changing recovery question, writing private note, etc. And AI chat, since we couldn't end this talk about, uh, like we are talking about AI. And uh, so that is the case study that we will talk about. Um, so example, Poisoning AI chatbot messages. So in this case, we're interested about Mistral, which is a French LLM company, which so who basically has its own uh, chat interface, similarly to ChatGPT. And what happens is that as an attacker, in this case, we might want to force the victim into disclosing the messages over the attacker session. And uh, so we might know that some people disclose kind kind of sensitive things to um, to AI, like they might use it as a as a free apist, as a free apist, or um, like provide sen sensitive uh, production code to it. So how are, are we able to do, to do that? Is that we first investigate how messages are, are sent unread. So there are three main requests in, uh, in Mistral for that. There is one request when, the, when, when it corresponds to the first new message. So this is this one, this is a post request. Then there is a, another HTTP request, which is, we, we like, which is when the message, the chat is already initiated. And finally, there's also a request when, like, to, to read the chat history. And what we want is actually to poison entirely this feature such that the victim would think to still be authenticated as the victim. So if you go back to the screen, like, you would, the victim at the bottom, at the bottom would still see his name on username. But, like, every, like, the main feature of this app would basically be poisoned by the attacker. And every chat that the victim would see, would send, would be sent under the attacker's account. And the victim wouldn't see any problem in that because he would be able to like read the messages he just sent, etc. So yeah. And so how do we poison this feature? Is like when whenever we notified the, the third, the, the like the free requests uh, that we want, we use we, we use cookie testing again and we set it just for the particular path. So still for the domain for, for the main parent domain, uh Mistral.ai, and we just set it for the path where um, the features of interest are. And so we inject still the attacker cookie. And so um, what's, the what's the detection methodology? Um, first, we, f we want to identify an action that leads to submission of sensitive data. So like chat feature, file upload, etc. And then we want actually to, to find this feature such that session token swapping, so swapping the session token of the victim with the attacker's one keeps the action functional, like we don't want to break this action, we don't want the victim to not be able to do it at all, otherwise it would make, it would make no sense. And um, we also don't want any reference of the attacker session on the victim's account, otherwise it wouldn't be any, any stealthy at all, and we want the victim just to act regularly, thinking it's like the, like the, 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 the feature is working fine, but under the hood, um, like sending um, requests from the attacker session. So, Conclusion and takeaways. Uh, out of scope can be first very useful, and a way to see out of scope is not as a target, obviously, you don't want that, but more as a way to, to find tools that will help you to target the main assets of an application. So, as a gadget provider, and Cookie Testing is a great example of gadget that is provided by out of scope. Um, also, self success as unrealized potential, um, it's a widely misunderstood and, uh, yeah, underestimated vulnerability that both uh, bug bounty hunters, pen testers, and program managers like don't really know of and underestimate, so which leads to them putting this as out of scope. Uh, so and now more related to the to the attacks, um, pay attention to how applications handle substates in multi-step process. And about that, more generally, actually multi-step processes are quite interesting um, for finding bugs. And if it's not about cookie testing, like there are often many interesting logic bugs there. So that's an interesting feature to look into. And when dealing with actions submitting sensitive data, you can check if you, you can check if it can be poisoned. So with the session swapping thing, 
And uh, yeah, so the main idea is still that cookie testing open, opens the door to many attacks. And this attack are not the only attacks possible by cookie testing. And I made some reference to a security researcher called File Descriptor, who, um, like, in the past, uh, submitted very interesting prior research about cookie testing. So if cookie testing is a topic which is a topic which interests you, I highly recommend to to look into that. So I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.